Good morning again. So as we learned last week, I had a the 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 Holy Spirit kind of led me to change my whole direction of where I was going. We were going to be in 1 Corinthians and that changed altogether and we started the book of Acts instead. And we're going to continue to go through the book of Acts. But I'm going to just flat out say up front, I'm exhausted. We did Cove Christian Camp this um, last three days. And it, though it was fun and though we got to teach the kids lots of stuff, I, I think us adults are a little wore out. And so bear with me as, as we go through this. Have grace and mercy because I might mess up some of the words or things like that. And I'm going to be drinking a little bit more coffee than normal. But as I was going through this section of Acts, I, I came across this interesting story that I think um, hits right at the heart of what we're going to be talking about. It's from Paul Campbell, who once told the story of a young missionary, um, Herbert Jackson, who was given a car to help him in his work. The car was a major asset, but it had one difficulty. It would not start without a push or a jump start. Jackson devised a system to cope with the car's inability to start. When he was ready to leave his home, he went to a nearby school and asked permission to bring some of the children out of class to help him push start his car. Throughout the day, he was careful to always park on a hill or leave his engine running when he stopped for short visits. For two years, the young missionary used what he believed was an ingenious method to enable him to use the car. When poor health forced Jackson's family to leave the mission field, a new missionary arrived to lead the mission. When Jackson explained to the new missionary his method for starting the car, the young man opened the hood and began inspecting things. Why, Dr. Jackson, he interrupted, I believe the only trouble is the loose cable. He gave the cable a twist, pushed the start, there's the switch and the engine roared to life. For two years, Dr. Jackson had used his own devices and endured needless trouble. When the power to start the car was there all the time, it only needed to be connected. Now you see, often we try to go through life and ministry disconnected from the power of God. We, we try doing things on our own, in our own way, instead of listening to the direction of the Lord. You see, Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to us so that we could always be connected to him as we live in relationship with God. We can't make the same mistake that Jackson made. We can't go through this life disconnected from God's power. If we expect to ever reach others and bring them to Jesus, we must be fully filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and we, we must be willing to let Jesus' Spirit take the, the reins and lead our lives for his purposes. So last week, we learned how the discipline of waiting is an active process. That's what we had learned last week. And we saw this through the events that took place in Acts chapter 1, in which Jesus commands the apostles to go back and wait for the Holy Spirit to come, to bring them God's mighty power that will help them in spreading the gospel to the world. And that is essentially where we left the apostles. However, today, starting in chapter 2 of Acts, we come to the faithful day in which Jesus sends the Holy Spirit down to the world, which jumpstarts the fire within the lives of his followers to move the church forward in its mission to spread the gospel not only to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, but to the remotest parts of the earth. In the first 13 verses, that's where we're going to be focusing is in the first 13 verses, we will learn one of the many roles the Spirit plays in our lives as followers of Christ. 
and within a, uh, being a part of the universal church that is around the world. Today we will learn that the Holy Spirit leads us as we reach the world. Seems simple enough, but there's a little bit more to it. So please turn with me, if you have it, to Acts chapter 2. We're going to be starting in verse 1. That's Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. God's Word says, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So stopping right there, we come to the first key point we can learn regarding the role the Holy Spirit takes within our lives, which is the fact that the Holy Spirit comes and fills us. That's something we need to understand. The Holy Spirit comes and fills us. We see right at the beginning, there is a transition taking place. Just a few verses previously, Luke had explained how the 11 apostles through God's selection had just brought Matthias into the group to take the place of Judas as the 12th apostle. Now Luke picks up telling us that the day of Pentecost had come. Now the day of Pentecost was the second of three major feasts that took place on the Jewish calendar. It fell 52 weeks after the week of Passover and was in the Old Testament times referred to often as the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Harvest, the Day of First Fruits. You see, the Day of Pentecost was a Thanksgiving celebration in which the Jewish people would celebrate and praise God for the provision from the spring's harvest. There is this amazing concept to be understood with the day of Pentecost in which Jesus sends his spirit to his people and the festival in which the people celebrate the recent harvest of the first fruits. You see, Jesus literally sends the first fruits of the Holy Spirit to the apostles. However, the real interesting part is how God through the Holy Spirit brings the first massive harvest of converts into the church shortly after which takes place after Peter preaches his first sermon when he's first filled with the Holy Spirit and led by the Holy Spirit. What a great symbolism presented to us here by Luke. And what a great way to display the importance of the Holy Spirit's role within God's church. Continuing as we read in verses two through four, we see this amazing moment in which the Spirit steps in and takes center stage. The verse says, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Here we're introduced to the, the, the first key concept of the Spirit's role within our lives. The Holy Spirit comes and fills us. And in this specific moment, it is done in such a grand display of holy power. There is a loud noise, like a violent rushing wind that fills the whole entire house. Could you just imagine that? the house the apostles were in. Then suddenly the presence of the Spirit, which can only be described in this imagery as tongues of fire stretching out, comes and rests on each of the apostles. In the first part of verse four, we see that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, this was a milestone in the history of the church. The day of Pentecost was the day in which God fulfilled his promise to pour out his spirit into the world so that the gospel message of Jesus Christ could be shared with all mankind. If you remember back to my previous sermon, Jesus kept trying to pull the apostles back to the, what was most important, which was the Holy Spirit's going to come. They kept trying to figure out other things. He keeps trying to pull them back. This is that moment. 
This is that moment that Jesus was preparing them for. The day of Pentecost was the day in which God fulfilled his promise to pour out his spirit into the world so the gospel message of Jesus Christ could be shared with all mankind. Even though we don't all experience the same grand display of the spirit coming into our lives as the apostles did, you know, we all don't see flames of fire coming down and touching our heads. But even though we don't all experience that same grand display, it doesn't change the fact that his mighty presence still comes and fills each and every believer today to lead, guide, and transform our lives. Charles Spurgeon once explained that without the spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are as ships without wind, branches without sap, like coal without fire, we're useless. We need to embrace the presence of the Spirit within our lives, just as the apostles did. And a massive part of embracing the Spirit in our lives is by obediently submitting to His will instead of our own. Yeah, I said it. I actually put two words that no one likes to hear together. Obedience and submission to the Spirit's will and not our own. To God's will, not our own. We need to be a people, we need to be a church that is daily choosing to submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, did you hear me when I said that? Daily. In fact, for some of us, it might be moment by moment. I know when I was doing the camp this last three days, there was some moment by moments. God, I need your spirit. Tell me what to do. Tell me how to do this the right way so I'm not just getting frustrated at these young children, but actually teaching them. Give me patience. And it was moment by moment at times. Yeah, I, I already prayed it long ago, so he's been teaching me patience ever since. I can now continue to ask for it because he's just going to give it. But that's the idea. We need to be submitting to his will and not our own. We need to be a people in a church that's choosing daily to submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit because this day, Sunday, though this is the day we gather, this isn't the only day the church exists. Monday through Saturday, we also exist all around the world. And so we need to, as the church, as the body of Christ, be submitting to his will Otherwise, we will be useless. And we will be unsuccessful in fulfilling our mission to reach the world. And that's all because without the Holy Spirit, we are only attempting to do ministry through our own strength, and our strength will eventually fail. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to come and fill us so that we are not functioning through our own will, but through the will of God. But what is really taking place when we are filled with the Spirit? Well, transformation begins taking place. We have to understand that. Our moral compass begins being transformed to resemble God's moral compass, meaning we will begin to stop letting our own selfish nature lead and decide what or how we do things. And instead, through obedience and submission, we now allow God's will to direct us which by nature, when we do that, we look completely different and shine out in new ways than, the, than any of the ways the world shows and demands that we live by. You understand that? We begin to shine out like lights in a darkness because the world's trying to get us to conform to its ways the ways of sin, the ways of evil, and yet through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are transformed to be light shining, to bring others to Christ. The Holy Spirit is such a powerful gift to be given by Christ. He sent us the one thing that we needed as people that can change us 
to become like him in our actions, in our thoughts, and in our lives. There is so much blessing that comes as we are filled by the Holy Spirit. We gain such a powerful presence when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And he is shaping us and transforming us to mirror his traits, not our own or the world's, but the very traits of Jesus Christ. The very Christ that we read in the Gospels, that we see what he was doing and going, how on earth did he do that? The Spirit helps us to mirror that. The day of Pentecost was such a miraculous day. It was the day in which not only the apostles were filled with the Spirit, but all who come to Christ are given the same opportunity to be just as filled and just as transformed. One of the roles of the Spirit is that he comes to fill us because the Holy Spirit leads us as we reach the world. But things don't just stop there. Continuing on, we pick back up at the, in the second part of verse 4. It says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit was given them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devoted men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speaking in his own language. Now the second key point that we can learn regarding the Spirit's role within our lives is that the Holy Spirit gives us his power. And I know it seems like it's kind of similar to the first one. He fills us, but now we're going to focus on the fact that he also gives us his power. He doesn't just fill us and sit there and do nothing. He gives us his power. We see that after the Spirit comes and fills the apostles, in the second part of verse 4, it says, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterances. The Spirit gave his power to the apostles, specifically at this moment, the ability to speak in tongues. However, it's at this point in the sermon that we must come to fully understand what this miraculous gift is. In verses 5 through 6, Luke makes it very clear for us. He points out the fact that there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devoted men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speaking in his own language. The gift of tongues, as described here, is the power to speak other various human languages. This is not speaking in the tongues of angels. And I know I might be stepping on some toes, especially with our, some of our more charismatic brothers and sisters out there that demand that that's a proof of whether or not you're saved. That's not what's going on here. Um, they are not speaking in the tongues of angels. They are speaking in the tongues of various different human languages. But even more than just understanding the truth of properly evaluating the text, because the text is pretty clear on what's actually taking place, we also learn that there is a distinct purpose for this power. There was a reason for it. The Holy Spirit is seeking to first reach all the various people groups within Jerusalem. Secondly, we see that the Lord is uniting the world, breaking the language barriers that he himself created during the Tower of Babel. All the way back, remember they were one language, they were able to communicate, then he split them up. That's being reversed in this moment. The time has now come for all people to come and enter the door that has now been opened. The Lord is breaking down all the various cultural groups, making the truth of Jesus Christ available to all through the apostles. So because the truth of Christ is offered to all, it transcends all barriers and by nature, we see this miracle taking place where the Holy Spirit gives us his power. And through the apostles in this time, it was to speak other languages that they didn't know. But this is only one concept of the Spirit's power. Did you know all who are in Christ have also been given the Spirit's power as well? 
And though we must also understand that much of the time his power is manifested in, in many ways, and it depends on the situation or the need, to move his gospel message forward, you see, we have all been given different various spiritual gifts. I've talked about this a lot recently, that we've all been given different spiritual gifts in this life. Some of us are gifted speakers in which you can understand the scripture and, and that allows you to share it with others in a way that they couldn't understand it. Others, where others are gifted with a, a truly compassionate heart in which you can build strong and lasting relationships with others, creating the opportunities to share Christ with them. The the list of the gifts the Lord has given to us as individuals is so long it would take days to go through them all on how each person's gifted differently for a specific reason. But the point is, it doesn't matter what gifts you have. The Spirit gives you the power to use those gifts to glorify Jesus, who is our Savior and our salvation. The Christian media magazine once explained that oftentimes when the Holy Spirit is upon us, we are given the power to do something a little out of our comfort zone. We may discover that we have a new boldness to go up to someone and pray for them. We may have the strength to speak the truth when before we might have kept our mouth shut out of fear. The Holy Spirit washes over us with a supernatural strength, maybe a physical strength like Samson had. We've heard many stories of car crashes where kids have helped save their parents, lifting things they never should have been able to lift. or in an internal strength to be courageous with words. We may receive a stronger backbone to stand up for what we believe in figuratively and literally. And that is one of the many roles the Spirit plays in our lives as God's people. See, I'm not by nature someone who likes to work with young children, but the Holy Spirit helped me to do it, and I had a great time doing it. It was out of my comfort zone, but yet I was still able to do it. It's the same way for you guys. The real question that starts popping in is, are you actually listening to what the Spirit's asking you to do? The Holy Spirit gives us his power so that we can move the gospel forward and so that the world may know what Jesus has done for them, allowing all people to have the chance to embrace salvation and everlasting life. But oftentimes we ignore that power because that power is asking us to do something we don't want to do. This is where that obedience and that submission comes back into play. Obedience and submission to the will of the Father. So, The Holy Spirit does lead us as we reach the world. And one of the ways he does that is by giving God's children his power so we can be successful in our missions. Various different missions. Various different things that we need to do to spread the gospel. And continuing on, we pick back up in verse 7, and this is where it gets kind of interesting. In verse 7... we see that God's word says, they were amazed and astonished, saying, why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is is it that, that each hear them in our own language or to which we were born? Now I'll probably mess up some things here, so I'm gonna try my best. Parathians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the district of 
Libya, around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jew and proselytes, Cretan, or Cretans and Arabs, we were, or we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God, and they all continue in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying they are full of sweet wine. We're stopping right here. This will be the end of the sermon, and we'll continue the story next week. But this is important. The final key point we can come to for today with regards to understanding the vast roles the Spirit plays in our lives and helps us to reach the world is that the Holy Spirit reaches others through us. We got to understand that we are now the vessels in which the Holy Spirit is working through us. Yes, can he work outside of us? Most certainly, nobody's denying that. But his church, his people, we are the ones he is working through. Luke continues explaining this miraculous event that is taking place. He uses strong and powerful words to explain the state of all who are present. He, he says that the people were amazed and astonished that they were hearing the apostles speaking in their own native language, the, the, where they were born. Jews that had been dispersed all, all over, who had been born somewhere else, speak completely different languages. They're now hearing this message coming from the apostles in their own native born language, especially for the fact that the apostles are Gentile or, or Galileans at this point. See, if you notice, they, they kind of ask that question, aren't all these guys Galileans? They, there's a reason for that. You see, Galileans were considered small town country people who spoke with a strong hillbilly-like accent. They were looked down upon and viewed as less educated because of this in their culture. Therefore, it astonished the crowds that they were speaking in such fluency and with such precision. Luke then continues in verses 8 through 11, describing for us in a list of various, uh, he describes this list of various different people groups that were pre present. And this list is quite interesting because it is not just given to show the different languages that are present, but it is a list that shows us the various different political regions and more specifically, 11 distinct geographical locations in which the Holy Spirit through the apostles is fulfilling the prophecy given in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 11 through 12, which says, then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand, the remnant of his people who will remain from, who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elma, Shemar, Hamarth, and from the islands of the seas, and he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the, the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The day the Holy Spirit came signified the return of the remnant of the Jewish tribes that were still scattered with the various geographical locations. They were born raised there, they would come over to Jerusalem for the Passover if they were able to. And we see that at this moment, at this time, there was a vast majority of Jews from all sorts of geolog geographical locations that were now all gathered in one spot. This is a big moment for the Jewish people because it is the proof of God's hand working within their lives. And the proof needed to show that the messianic age in which Jesus is ruling as king is indeed here. And this was all done through the 12 apostles. Of course, there were others that were actually there, but the 12 apostles took the main lead at this point. The Holy Spirit reaches others through us, but that doesn't mean that everyone will be reached. Looking at verses 12 through 13, it says, and they all continued in amazement and, 
and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying they are full of sweet wine. You see, there were many there that were in fact amazed and perplexed, leading them to ask, what does this mean? Which is a great question. They're starting to, <laughs> what's going on here? We, we, we need to know more. This question is showing their interest, and, and there were many people that were interested in what was taking place. They wanted to know what um, the, the Lord was doing, what's take, what, what this miraculous event could be, and the, the Holy Spirit here is opening doors that, have been, that are now opening for the apostles to be able to reach these various different people groups, to speak more in depth about Jesus and salvation that comes only through him. Where on the other hand, there were those who were mocking the apostles, writing them off as drunks who were just muttering nonsense. That's what it means. It was early in the morning. We'll see Peter later on address this. Um, it was early in the morning and they were saying, well, these guys are just drunk. Sadly, not everyone will accept the truth of Jesus. That's a fact. And his free gift of salvation. No matter how much I wish that all people would, the fact is, sadly, some will choose not to. But that doesn't stop us from continuing to reach out to them. The Holy Spirit reaches others through us. But with that statement, the question must be asked, are you allowing the Spirit to work? You see, the Holy Spirit is not going to force you to do anything. You always have a choice. Sometimes we choose to listen, sometimes we don't. However, like we see from the example of Jesus' time of ministry on this earth, we need to continually choose to submit to the guidance of the Spirit and allow Him to lead us as we interact with others in this life. If you remember Jesus' ministry, the Holy Spirit ascended upon him like a dove, and right after that, the Holy Spirit led him out into the desert. Jesus was constantly letting the Holy Spirit lead his mission. And we need to be willing to do the same. We need to look at his example and begin to mirror it and show the same type of obedient submission. We need to continually choose that submission. We need the guidance of the Spirit. The church can only be successful in spreading the gospel when it is filled and led by the Holy Spirit. Jesus ch chose to be spirit-led as he did ministry on earth. The apostles chose to be spirit-led as they ch spread the gospel to the world. All of Christ's followers today who make up the universal church must also choose to submit to the will of God and allow the Spirit to lead us as well. Nothing's changed from their time and the beginning and the formation of the church to now. We must let the Spirit do His job through us. Otherwise, we will never be truly successful in reaching our friends, our families, our neighbors, or any of the lost and the broken within this world. God's plan for His people is that we live life filled with his spirit. An unknown author once said, as Christians, we are privileged to have the Holy Spirit available to us to guide us and strengthen us. The Holy Spirit gives us wisdom so that we can stay on the path that God has for us. If you ever feel confused or alone, remember that Jesus gave us his holy comforter, the wise Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit reaches others through us. We must be willing to let him lead us. Just like the apostles did during the world-changing day of Pentecost in which the helper that Jesus promised was poured out for all who would believe. We truly have been blessed by the Lord. The Holy Spirit plays such a vital role in God's plan for our lives. It was through the Spirit that Jesus our Lord was successful in ministry. It was through the Spirit that Jesus was able to endure the cross in which he gave his life and died to free us from sin and bring salvation. And it was through the Spirit that Christ was raised from the dead, conquering death once and for all. 
Jesus is the one who opened the door for all of his followers to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who leads us as we reach the world for Christ. And he does that by filling us with his presence, giving us his power, leading us to reach other people. It is through God's church that the lost will be reached. The gospel message has been spreading all throughout the world at a miraculous rate since the day of Pentecost and on. Let's be united as God's universal church of believers and continue the mission today. Let's be just as impactful as the apostles were in their time. They were a bunch of fishermen, nobodies. They then were filled with the Holy Spirit and boom. Pretty soon we're gonna see a vast number of people come to God from one sermon. Now it's not just because Peter was good at speaking. I can tell you that, it's because the Holy Spirit showed up. Let's be united as God's universal church of believers and continue the mission today. Let's be just as impactful. We have the exact same spirit in us as they did. Oftentimes I think we forget that. We go, well, they, there was something else going on there. It's the same Holy Spirit in all of us today that make Jesus Lord of our life. We have a mission to fulfill, and the only way we will ever achieve it is if we are a people who let the Holy Spirit lead as we reach out to the rest of the world. The question is, will you obediently submit to that leading and let the Holy Spirit take you to the uncomfortable places to reach the broken hearts, the lost souls. Those are the questions we have to be willing to answer and the actions we must be willing to implement. Are you going to be obedient and submit and let God lead? Let his spirit lead. The Holy Spirit wants to reach the lost and broken and he wants to use you to do it. So let him. Will you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this section in Acts that shows us that what Jesus had promised to his followers, that the helper is going to come, the Holy Spirit is going to come and give you power and the ability to, to move this mission of the church and the gospel message of Christ forward. And we just thank you for revealing just how important the Holy Spirit's role is in our lives, that we truly need to be in obedience submission to his will and, and his guidance and his leading because he wants to do amazing things through us to reach the lost and broken, to draw more and more to you. So help us to be faithful, Father. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. So as the praise team starts making their way forward, we're going to sing a song. And I just want to offer a couple little invitations. First and foremost, I want, to, I want to say that this is the place to be okay to be broken. It's all right to be struggling here. You're in a safe place with people who care about you. And this is the place to be able to be broken and draw closer to the Lord. So I just wanted to offer that, that it, don't be worried if you think somebody's gonna like point a finger at you or something. No, it's okay to be broken here. That's not gonna happen. You are loved and it's okay to be broken at times. And we as the church, it's part of our job to be the comfort in those moments. But also, I want to offer the invitation, if somebody happens to be here and Jesus isn't Lord of your life and you would like to make him Lord of your life, anytime during this song as we're singing it, you're welcome to come forward. I'd love to have you sit here and I'd love to chat with you a little bit afterwards. And um, after we are done chatting, 
we are having cookie hours, so it's not that hard to fill up the baptismal, and we could have a baptism as well. But if you already have made Jesus Lord of your life, you don't have to come forward for this decision. Have you obediently been submiss- submitting to the leading of the Holy Spirit in your lives? Has he been asking you to reach out or do something to move the gospel forward to someone that you may have just been going, eh, I really don't want to do that. If that happens to be you, now's the time to say, all right, Lord, lead. I'll submit and I will be obedient. You don't have to come forward to do that. That's a heart thing. But make a decision. And I pray that you choose to let the Spirit lead. So will you please stand as we sing this song? You may all be seated. We have some trivia. How many different nations are listed in Acts 2, 9 through 11 as being present in Jerusalem? 15. 15. All together. You, you guys were close. 11, 12, just a little bit off. In Acts 2, 15, now we didn't hit this, but if you know this story, you should actually be able to pick some of these up. What time of the day does Peter say it is when he defends the apostles against accusation of drunkenness? What time? Early Early morning. And that's, I tried to, I knew that this was in there, so I tried to kind of foreshadow the drunken part, hoping somebody would listen. Um, in Acts 2, 16 through 21, Peter quotes which Old Testament prophet to explain the events taking place? Who said that? <laughs> nice. <laughs> you read ahead. According to Acts 2, 41, how many people were baptized after hearing Peter's message? 3,000. You ever want to know the power of the Holy Spirit? That's crazy right there. That's crazy power. Prayers and praises. I have um, two here. Um, Where Levi's asking prayers for J. It's J. Parlo. Did I did I say that right? He's having open heart surgery, but they don't know the date of the surgery yet. So we just need to be praying for Jay Partlow and um, keeping him in our, our thoughts and our minds. And we'll get that on the prayer list as well. Um, so that when we do get a date, a more specific time, we'll be able to know who we're praying for and at what time. Also, David and Carmelita, they're asking, um, please pray for our friend Don Shannon, he's having a health problem, so we don't know what the health problem is, but he's struggling, and so be praying for Don Shannon um, and his um, health. 
is there anything else I may have missed? I, I, wanna, I do want to pray for all the firefighters that's going to be brought up. Braxton? Okay, so Glow has asked us to continue to pray for Braxton, who is on our prayer list. Um, you, you might want to go through the um, list that's in your bulletin to find out the specifics. Okay. The daughter by Luke, who was the daughter of Selma, and uh, Selma is a longtime uh, church member here. And then if you guys see the older guy, I forget what his name is, he comes off and on from out at uh, Hartman. Melvin uh, uh, is her uncle. Yeah. Okay. So that's how we know that, that who, who we're praying for and why, <laughs> and how we're connected. Yeah, we would. <laughs> a little context does help. <laughs> help makes our prayers a little more specific. Can we remember to bring uh, prayers for our piano player so we get her back? <laughs> Pr prayers for Mary Kay's safe travels. I talked to CJ and, and uh, the other guy that was with us today. Yes, it is. Yeah, I know she was. <laughs> this surgery, she has a surgery coming up. Uh, if you want to know, you need to talk to her about what it is. But she has a surgery uh, coming up this Thursday, and we'll be praying for her. Okay, so prayers for CJ um, with her upcoming surgery on Thursday, and also just praise the Lord for the fact that Cove Camp went well and um, it was successful. Well, we need to pray for, even, there's even more. There were a couple accidents that have happened in the week. So let's pray for all of those who, families that were affected by the various different um, accidents that have happened this week. All right. I didn't have a pencil, so I couldn't write all of that down. Um, I'm going to do my best. We have all heard them the prayer requests, and so let me just give a prayer that's going to address the situations. Dear Heavenly Father, a lot of people have been brought up um, in which we're asking for healing and help with their health, and I just pray, Lord, you know each and every one that was mentioned here today. I pray that your healing hands will be wrapped around each and every one of them, that you will also, Father, be with um, any doctors, any nurses, that they will be tools in your hand, that you will be able to help these individuals with the various different ailments that are, they're struggling with. Father, I, I pray for all those who have um, been recently in car accidents, the, the families that are grieving and dealing with all of that and everything that was involved with all of these accidents, any animals or anything like that, Father, that you would just be with those who are going to be affected by this. This is a great time of loss um, for many, and they will need your comfort as they grieve. Help us as the church, if there is anything we can do that you point to, point it out to us and help us to be faithful to bring that comfort and that peace if possible. Father, I also just want to um, praise you and thank you so much for helping camp go successfully. Um, it's, it's always fun to see such young children learning about who you are and just see those lights in their eyes start to shine brighter as they um, begin to understand who you are and what you mean to them and their lives and what you have done for them. Father, I also want to just reach out and ask that you continue. We, it's a praise first and foremost for all the firefighters. It is just amazing to see how many people have... Um, come out to, to fight these fires. So pr thank you first and foremost for that. But I ask that you will be with each and every one of them who are fighting the fires, that you would protect them, give them wisdom and the ability to do their job well. And I just pray, Lord, that you will use them and continue to use them to um, get this fire under, these fires under control and so that we can 
um, see the land start to heal itself and be healed again as we move forward in the summer. Lord, I also just want to pray for all those who are also supporting the firefighters in various different ways, whether it's giving them food, whether it's giving them um, places to sleep and shelter. Lord, will you please bless them for the fact that they have the ability to, to be that generous, to be that kind and willing to help. Please bless them and watch over them as well. I pray, Lord, for the, everybody here that you, Father, will just watch over us as we walk out these doors today. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be obedient and in submission to your will. Not to be pushing against you, but to let you lead. Because when we do that, Lord, it's amazing what you can do through us. And we ask that you will work through us in that manner. And so I just pray also that you just keep everybody in this building, even our members who aren't here, anybody who's online, keep us safe throughout this week as we go about serving you. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, will you please stand? We're going to sing one last song. Spirit, take you into an uncomfortable place this week. You are dismissed. <laughs>